So we know the, the so far we've only covered the first uh, couple chapters verses uh, nine, ten, and eleven and twelve, and so um, today we're going to be covering chapter uh, thirteen, <clears throat> which is a very it's a very short chapter, so we don't have as much to cover in terms of uh, text, uh, but it's a very deep uh, uh, chapters. I think it's very familiar to many of us. Many churches like to prefer to read this chapter uh, of First Corinthians thirteen at weddings because it's all about love um and so and then as we know that in last week's chapter 12 we know it's talking about the the struggles with uh spiritual gifts right and how we're called to overcome uh those uh the different biases and people's struggles of making the group as soon as like we talked about last time and highlighting that there's a division that are being caused because of which spiritual gifts people have or, 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 or exalting in one sense. You know, he ends chapter 12 by saying, as we talked about last time, I'll flip that to the one. Um, uh, there's a more surpassing way, and that's in verse uh, uh, thir 31 of chapter, uh, of chapter 12. But earnestly desire the best gift, and that I show you a more, more excellent way. And that leads us into this chapter 13, of the chapter on uh, love, right? And there's only 13 verses so you have chapter 13 with only 13, uh, with 13 verses of, in it. And, and St. Paul is highlighting for us uh, the importance of not uh, overstating uh, the power of the spirit, the power of the gifts that God gives to us, right? He's reminding us particularly in this, in this chapter that the most important thing uh, we should be having or, or desiring uh, to obtain and to have as our own and that all of us should have is love right and that's that's the main um the main um uh idea or at least the the, the main thrust for this chapter like without love there's not there's no real meaning to all the different things that you can try to uh, puff you know to try to hang your hat on or try to say that you have right and so but as a before i get into all the you know the the, the specifics on that like i said this is a very familiar chapter Particularly, you know, you know, even in our church, we read from Ephesians 5 uh, because it talks about how a husband and wife are called to be as one. That's why we, we want to highlight that in the within our marriage service and that sacrament, knowing that two people are becoming as one flesh. But when you talk about what it means to truly love, I remember a couple, I think last year at one of our weddings, uh, um, Rambachan gave a good message. And he said, if you when you look at that, those verses are talking about uh, of chapter 13 when it says about what love is and that's in that second half he says and if you really talk about you know love for love suffer long love does not uh, envy it does not puff up it never fails you know and so on and so forth he says and if you replace that the word love with you know the person's name you know the person being married like the groom or the bride or whoever or us reading it because like chris suffers long or chris never fails or you know we're, we're, we should be thinking how they should be part of us because just like in the previous chapter, the Corinthians, one of the struggles and the problems that St. Paul is having to uh, uh, to write against or write to uh, exhort to overcome the, the struggle is that people are exalting or looking to obtain or to have as their own are these different spiritual gifts. And the last chapter highlighting that there are some people who, you know, who exalt speaking in tongues more than anything, uh, more than any uh, of the other gifts. But if you look at it, especially this chapter 12, 13, only on love, the whole thing reminds us that this is what we, they should all and them and us included, we should be looking that we should, our name should be attached towards, right? Attached to, I should say. And so he's emphasizing and showing us and explaining to us why it's so important, right? And so you can break down this uh, chapter 13 into three sections, even though small, you can talk, you can see that that first section emphasizes the importance of love in the first few verses. And then the second uh, section of this chapter, he defines uh, love by what it is and what it does. And that's one of the part that most of us are familiar with. All the qualities of love and how it should be or what it's not. And then it ends in the last few verses uh, with the permanence of love's qualities. 
in contrast to the temporary nature of spiritual gifts, right? Or other things, right? Because like I said, this chapter is how, how it's, you know, arranged within this uh, first epistle uh, of St. Paul to the Corinthians. It's put in there here in the middle or near the, I should say, near the end, middle of this section about exhorting the people against these uh, spiritual, you know, against exalting one spiritual gift over the other. Um, this section on love reminds us this is what we should be really uh, looking toward, right? And so if you read the first three verses, if someone can just read this for us, it's uh, verses one through three of uh, chapter 13, and then we can, then we'll all go through some of the parts of it and explain uh, and explaining. Someone can just read for me, please. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it's it profits me nothing. You can, you can stop there. Thank you. So when we look at this, this first three verses of First uh, Corinthians thirteen, uh, we see a lot of different things. The, the main focus is it's the importance of love, right? And then he, he talks about different things of what people might look to have. And then the first uh, verse, he talks about prophecies, right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have, be, uh, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing, right? So the first part, the clanging cymbal is just a very good uh, imagery about showing that it, you know, without love, all of the other things that we might have, Particularly, he highlights about the tongues of men because that was when he was um, warning against, you know, trying to of looking to be as the best of all other of the gifts. He's saying even if you have that gift of speaking in tongues, but you don't have love, it's just like uh, making noise, right? That's what he says. That's what it compares to. And then if you look in the Greek, it says that this I have become a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. It's kind of very poetic. It has this uh, the, the 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 syllables of the Greek have kind of a rhyme to it. And, and it has a, a repeating uh, consonant. So then it makes, it's kind of a nice argument and a kind of a way of getting people to see that image saying you could, it's just something loud. You can imagine if our kids are just yelling, I, you know, I have a young three-year-old and if he's just making noise, nothing can be understood, right? Uh, but we know that, you know, if as much as we're, we get upset with our kids for yelling and screaming, you know, uh, just un unnecessarily, you know, we have to lovingly get them to stop, right? If we just yell back at them, nothing, nothing changes, right? So that's why St. Paul is highlighting it. This without love, we can't do anything. At the same time, when he talks about the gift of prophecy, that's another one people will wholly uh, want to exalt. And this that gift of prophecy, like we kind of talked about last time, and when we explain the gifts, it's the delivering of the messages of God. You know, if you even if you can do that, but you don't do that out of love or have any love for the people you're giving that message, it's like we can think of it as like uh, Jonah the prophet. You know, like we just want to go away. And we, and, and we have that sense that there's no need to do it. But then God said, no, even if you don't like them, or you, like as Jonah said, he didn't like the, the Ninevites because they were part of the enemy. The Assyrians were looking to overtake the Jewish people. But still, the, without love, it has no meaning. Because even though Jonah didn't understand of why he had to preach that gospel to them, they, the, people of Nineveh, the, city, the people of the city of Nineveh repented. So we have to have that love. The same with the mysteries, which is the God's word and his providence. And if we're not, you know, if you even can understand even the limited amount, which we, no one can understand the fullness of God's mysteries. But even if someone had that insight, limited insight, but is it not out of a love, it means nothing, right? Same thing with knowledge of all things divine or human. You know, if we're not having a love about it, uh, as St. Paul says, it's just things that you have but that has no real deep meaning to us, right? It might puff ourselves up, which I'll talk about later, but if it doesn't connect us with God, it, and connect us with each other and and using that knowledge using that mis that understanding of mystery to bring us to the knowledge of one true god because that in the, uh, in the end uh, us as christians believe that all true uh knowledge and uh, all mysteries of the world uh yeah, that we desire it should be leading us to the one you know of 
of God, the wonders of how this world is made and how God is uh, uh, intimately involved in all the great mysteries of this of creation, we can find that God is there, right? And so, though we can't fully comprehend it, because uh, uh, we as humans are limited, but that it's because of love for Him, love for another. That's where that's where it, ha- it finds its purpose. So, so that even in the same way as it goes um, further, you know, even if you have all the faith to move mountains and, and do all those things, you need to be able to do these great miracles, right? Um, though, but if you don't have any love for it, it doesn't, you know, it can it doesn't mean much, right? Like one way, like when you think about this idea of uh, or a, a message of moving mountains. You know, with the scriptures, we know that's that's something that Christ said when he says, if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can you can be able to move a mountain, right? Um, and so that's and and as Christians, we believe that's a true statement, like we have to have full committed faith to God and we can do great things, right? And so and within the Coptic church, they have a tradition that says that you know the their uh, Christmas noim or the Christmas land or the nativity fast, uh like in the more in the olden days, it's a, it's always been a 40-day fast. In our church, we've made it now 25, but in the Coptic church, they made it 43. They added three days to it uh, on their calendar. And part of the reason is, uh, I forgot the century, I think it was the sixth or seventh or the eighth or ninth century. Um, you know, there was the, the Muslim ruler has already taken over. So I forgot, so it's after sixth or seventh, but I think it's eighth or ninth century. Um, the, the, you know, is, Egypt is now under Muslim rule, and he, you know, but he's very learned and he likes to di- hear different things. And as he read this, you know, Jesus says you can move mountains with the faith of mustard seed. So he called the patriarch and the, the leader, the bishops of the Coptic Church, who were Christians who were there. He says, "Hey, your Jesus and your Bible says if you have this little bit of faith, you can move a mountain. If your God is, if your the way you believe in Jesus is true, I want to see you move a mountain." And so the part of the you know, then the the patriarch is very uh, um, um, uh, worried in one sense, you know, but but the same because you know what. But that's he goes, that's what we believe. And he calls a three-day fast amongst the, all the community, pray and fast. So that when the day comes and they go to a mountain, they'll pray and fast and ask God's providence. And, and the as tradition says, and when the time came, and after all the praying and fasting of all the, the bishops, the priests, and all the faithful, they wrote the call and told everyone around the city. And when they went to that mountain, it says the mount, mountain shook at the moment and it moved. Um, and so um it was a great uh, miracle, right? You know, and there's some more to the story. There's a, there's a Saint Simon this Tanner was also part of it, but you know that it strengthened the the patriarch at the time. Um, and so, but it reminds us, um, even though they were able to move that mountain and it was able to change the the caliph's mind of allowing the Christians to worship freely, um, if it wasn't out of love, like the patriarch said, you know what, I can I can do find some way out of doing it. If it wasn't done out of a loving heart and a desire to you know. You know, for his love for Christ, love for his 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 flock, his people, the Coptic Christians. If that wasn't there, the it, you know, even if they were able to make the mountain shake and move, it wouldn't mean much. It wouldn't really transform, change things. And so that's what SMO says. You can do all those things, but it won't really transform things. So in the same way, he even said that he makes the analogy about even if you give all your things to the to the poor, but not doing kind of loving heart, but looking for praise. Right, looking so people say, "Oh, look how great this person is." He's helping the poor by selling goods and giving them money and all those things. And so he says um, that's also doesn't mean much. And the same thing, even if you give your life, if it goes one step further, which it would it would seem if people who are martyrs are giving their life um, for the this uh, for something, but if it's not done out of a loving heart, he still says it's meaningless, right? And so um, that's where our, our Saint Paul is very particular that all these sacrifices are useless and profitless without love and so we have to be mindful that uh that is the core thing i want to talk about martyrs or people who give the life in service you know and protecting others or protecting their children or protecting their community or protecting their country or uh, uh, supporting their family their countries or, or the communities by service if we're only doing it to get our name in a paper or to get attention so that doesn't mean that didn't it's not really showing a real and true love right and so we have to be very mindful of that we can even so we, uh, uh, um, uh, think about it and even in the old testament stories you know time and time again uh when things were done out without love um the for the people or the community there's you know they didn't really transform right even like we think of moses um one of the reasons you know he wasn't able to enter the promise because when he 
struck that rock that one time, you know, you know, he didn't listen to God. And sometimes it, one way is it's not clear exactly why that, that was such a big deal. But in one sense, when you look at it, you know, he said it was out of anger. He hit that rock and just so the people would stop complaining and he can provide them water. And so that's it. You can see it wasn't done out of love, but out of like a, a, a consternation or a, a anger in one sense. You know, he was just very uh, annoyance that he did it. So he was still able to make the water come because God said he'll provide the water. But he did it when he motioned and hit the rock. And it wasn't done in a, a way that was because he loves his community and loves his people. It was because he's annoyed, right? And so that's what it says. It was profitless for Moses even at that moment, right? And so we see that uh, that importance of love. It's very uh, in, uh, important and integral in, in our connection and understanding and growing in our growing in our faith. And then we'll go now to the next section, which is verses four. Sorry, excuse me, four through eight. If someone can just read these. Um, four or five verses for me, please. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. We're focused on the first couple of verses. So this, you know, particular verses four um, through seven, this is the one that we see a lot of like cards or or, or, or on you know, like posters or things you can hang up in your house, like those kind of things. It's just things that we can make. Is a, like, these are really great understanding of what love is, right? And how we should be connecting with one another. When if you kind of pick up on the highlight in some specific what love is, or how it should be and what it's not, you know, when it talks about love is patient, you know, we can see it in, in, in a general sense or in an in a overall sense, in our patient towards all men. That is, uh, we're willing to be uh, suffering the wrongs done uh, to it without turning to bitterness. So we're, we're willing to suffer uh, even if it's harming us yeah, because of love, because without it, we turn to bitterness. And so that's one of the key things that, you know, we know that we have to have, but it's so hard to really uh, have. You know, also then when we, when we come for confessions, myself included, you know, last time we'll, we'll, we are very uh, much saddened or we know that, you know, we're very quick to anger towards our family members, our children, our spouses, our parents, uh, whoever it might be, right? And one of the key things, you know, that you know, I know I tell myself, and I try to help others when they ask me about it, you know, saying we need to learn to be patient, right? You know, that's one of the key things, because as we read in this First Corinthians 13, it says it's willing to be patient. So that meaning we don't, even when we are wronged, we don't allow ourselves to turn bitterness because sometimes we feel like we're being wrong and we need to yell back or to say something back. But patience teaches us, the patience of love teaches us that even if it's wrong to us, we feel it's wrong to us, we don't return it back. We be patient and listening and understanding. And so we don't, so that we don't turn to bitterness because even if we keep arguing, keep fighting, also it gets even worse, right? There's a hatred and uh, we do even more sinful things, right? So we have to first and foremost have that patience to endure, to suffer the wrongs, even if it's be it true, you know, like a real wrong where like you're you're being really persecuted or just a, 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 um, a perceived wrong because we feel like we've been wrong, like because of our maybe some selfishness or maybe you know a misunderstanding, whatever it might be. We have to be patient and to be able to. Uh, uh, respond and love before responding in anger, right? And like also that ties with being kind. Love is kind, meaning we're we are willing to be caring, uh, compassionately for others, seeking ways to heal. And so that kind of ties with patient. Like even as much as we might be hurt, we uh, we should have a mind. If it's a mind of love, is how we can uh, seek ways to heal the brokenness, either in a relationship because of our own kind of uh, personal relationships helping others and, and their relationship like St. Paul is doing for the Corinthians. And so uh, having this kind of uh, loving 
principle in our lives and these characteristics or uh, uh, ways of showing Allah, it has to, and that's all how we see it really uh, enduring, right? So that's why it's also not jealous or envious, meaning we don't grudge the joy and success of others. And this is another one that many of us might feel, you know, we get envious or we of how people, other people have so many good things and, uh, and like that, or have things or, you know, enjoy, like it says, enjoying success because they're getting promotions or, you know, they're able to get in that program and we're not, whatever it might be, in our whatever our situation might be, that we're feeling jealous or grudging or envious. If, if a loving heart will help us to be, you know, we should be joyful for them and the success of others, right? Uh, and so we are able to rejoice in that they've been able to be blessed and that we share in that with them and for them and, and, and supporting them. At the same time, when we are blessed, we do not brag. That's what it says, you know, later in, the, in these verses. We're not boasting or crowning about our own self-importance. So those go hand in hand. So when we have been blessed, we don't look to exalt ourselves or boast about how great we are. And so when others are blessed, so then if ideally if they also have a loving heart, they won't brag about it, but use that talent, that ability, or that blessing they've had in the building up of the uh, of their friends and their community and their families, right? And so then they go hand in hand. So then there won't be this back and forth, but a, a, a mutual sharing, right? At the same time, that also goes with about not being puffed up, right? That we're not uh, vaunting our, uh, uh, itself or looking, for, uh, as it says, at the well, one quite a fun in a, in a uh, one one book, it's vaunting itself like a conceited, uh, conceited windbag, meaning we're not looking just to toot our own horn or to, to spread the news or oh, how great I am kind of thing, right? Sometimes we might feel like when people are talking in public settings or now with social media, they're just posting and we might feel like, oh, they're just trying to get attention, whatever it might be. True love uh, will show or remind us that that's not how we are called to present the talents, the abilities, the spiritual gifts, whatever it might be we have been blessed with. We have to, uh, if we have a true loving heart or if love is really something that we're desiring to c continue to uh, up, build up in ourselves as Christians, this is what we're having to make sure we're doing uh, wholeheartedly, right? And making sure we're uh, fulfilling those things. And if you go further, like it says, love does not behave in a way uh, uh, that's compromising good manners or morals. As it says, you know, it, it's not, uh, un is un unselfish. I forgot, I put it unself. And as unbiased, is that easily provoked, like it says, meaning we don't get engaged, uh, enraged, I'm sorry, but keep self-control. Uh, so are we keep our uh, anger in check. It does not keep score, right? That's tying to that, uh, tying to this, uh, not being jealous or envious or bragging. We're not trying to keep score, especially even sometimes in, in our personal relationships, you know, when when we're very, be with our, particularly with our spouses, maybe, or children, or, or our friends, you know, parents, whatever it might be, we start thinking, oh, they have wronged me at this point, so we'll find a way to maybe bring it up in an argument, right, later. So if we're, you know, true love won't, won't be returning the favor, and that, like, we're, we're going to show them by uh, in another means uh, how it hurt me kind of thing, right? So it doesn't rejoice in that iniquity, but it love is filled uh, with sadness by wrongdoing of any kind. So when we do any kind of wrong, if it's wrong to us or future wrong to others because we're out of spite or because we're trying to keep score, it only ends uh, poorly. So love or world does not want that. So it rejoices with truth uh, in its triumph. So when true love is there, the truth of the blessing that we all share in together because God has blessed us and we're called to share that blessing, then that, uh, you know, godly love is triumph, it triumphs for us, right? And so does these, for, these are, you know, verses for uh, five, six, seven, and in eight, which connects to this section, the next section, reminds of all the things. So when we really have true love and we're really desiring to have that in our hearts, then it gets to the end of bears all things, right? Meaning we're willing to, or we're able to cover over sins with silence, enduring slights and insults. So even when we're being harmed, or, or we feel like we're being, um, um, I'm sorry, or, or I don't want to say go to a full sense of a persecutor, like this is kind of a, maybe like when you think about insults, uh, but uh, but not a, in a verbal way, not physical way. It's kind of it's meaning we're willing to bear, because we know that when we look at Christ, He bore all things, even to the point of death, right? Uh, that He suffered uh, punishment uh, as an innocent, that willingly took up the cross, died on the cross, but uh, resurrected from the tomb, right? So the, that's where we start seeing the fullness, especially as we're in uh, the Great Lent and we get closer to Holy Week, where we're being reminded when it says bear all things. We see the the like a, a physical bearing as we see Christ carrying that cross, right? And when it's, so it's not just 
mentally or spiritually bearing, we even know that the, the cross itself reminds us if there was a weight that even our Lord is willing to carry, uh, that's greater than we could ever imagine. More than just the wood, the heaviness of the wood that he had to carry on that road to Golgotha to be hung on the cross. You know, the weight of all things, right? So we have to make sure we have to be willing to bear it. But just as Christ says, he does not give us a cross that we cannot bear, right? And so we're having to, you know, we don't carry it ourselves. You know, God is there with us. We can give it to him in prayer. And we, we and uh, he strengthens us to be able to uh, cover those sins, not by our own doing, but by the grace and mercies of God. So at the same time, love is not uh, distrustful or suspicious, meaning it's not to be, we have to be wise. It's not to mean we just are gullible and just believe everything, right? But it's not, it's not negative. We don't, it's not a quick to be like, oh, I don't know if that's true or not. Or suspicious of people's. We have, it have, if we have a true loving heart, we have to, we have to have a sense of a benefit of the doubt. Uh, be smart or be wise. At the same time, be like a loving heart will give always chance to see the people to do the right because God has created us as good. So we give that chance for people to do or trust people that they, what is is right, right? So we're hopeful for the best, right? We we are hopeful for what God uh, has in plan for all of us. So it endures patiently persecution and suffering to me it's an unyielding persistent so even even during times of very big struggle love teaches us to endure all the things because the security of love over all is shown by its survival of all with it uh, with which it is compared right it's eternal and imperishable that's you know even though when we think about our church our malankar church you know we're very blessed we're not having to endure much persecution though even now kind of in india it's very difficult uh, to work as Christians in one sense. We're not being killed or persecuted in Kerala particularly, but in some places in India, it is getting to that point. Um, some people, a lot of, many Christians are suffering physical uh, uh, persecution, even to death a handful. But then, you know, like the when you look at the Coptic church, they even there much persecution and sufferings, but they're still a strong, vibrant church. Though they're a minority, they're a, a large minority within Egypt. And though they continue to endure not losing hope in their Lord Jesus Christ and showing us that even in, in struggle and in, in pain and persecution, the light of Christ is that, and you know, during, even during the um, uh, many years back during the Arab, uh, Arab uprising and there's a lot of uh, Muslims trying to take control of a lot of the Middle East. They took in North Africa, they took a lot of these Coptic Christians and, and, and murdered them. And they, they were known as martyrs of the church because the, the only reason they were uh, beheaded is because they were Christian, nothing else. They're taken prisoners by these uh, extremists, right? And then just recently, I, we don't know all the details of why, other than people who don't like uh, the church or don't like these the, the 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 work that the church, the Coptic church, particular is doing in South Africa. Though it's you know it's a pretty much a you know South Africa kind of is a um a democracy country, but with its own struggles. But you know it's 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 a heartbreaking to know that three Hutchins are taken and and martyred or killed, uh, and it seems only because of their uh, being as Christians, you know, there are monk priests, there are Romachans who are giving their life for it and building up the the missions of the church in uh, in South Africa. And even I and I saw on WhatsApp, uh, the UK, Europe, uh, uh, South uh, Africa diocese showed pictures of you know their those Achins. They have an, uh, they have a picture with when uh, Stephanos Therminy and the handful of people who live in South Africa were able to use the Coptic church there for to do our own kurban, and they have a picture with these Achins. And so it's. Uh, we know that even then that the heartbreakingness of knowing that their lives are lost is because of their willingness to continue to build up the love for Christ and that in the communities there that's not their own but they're willing to go and to share that and to build up the church uh, in South Africa it just shows that you know the, the message is coming from the Catholic church and from even the community there is not one of oh, of uh, anger uh, uh, like wanting to kill but knowing that they know that that they are more love uh, the Christ there with Christ, and we we continue prayer to Christ to show us that His light shine and to uh, uh, overcome uh, the hatred and anger of others, and see that they're only coming in love, right? What they're what the church is doing there is only to build up uh, communities of love, right? In Jesus Christ, right, and to stand firmly in the faith uh, uh, against you know uh, evil and sin, and and to bring. Uh, um, reconciliation and harmony of communities, right, uh, in Christ, right, and so we continue to pray for them. We lose, uh, keep our hope 
because love is, as it says, eternal and imperishable. That's what really conquers all. Though we, the evil might think it can kind of suppress us, uh, but by because of our of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us and what He continues to do for us, and uh, we have that strong faith, and that's founded in this love, right? And then finally, we get to this last section. Uh, you know, you can read verses eight through thirteen. If someone can just read this last part of uh, of this First Corinthians thirteen, and then we'll uh, go through the last couple of points uh, with the slides, and then wrap up for tonight. If someone can just read that for me, please. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, when that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I become a man, I put away the childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also I am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Thank you, sir. So when you look at the, the, these uh, last this last section of uh, this chapter, you see that the gift of prophecy prophesying will cease, right? And then when it comes in terms of the end times, and when we think of the the greatest thing will be love, prophesying will cease. The gift of speaking uh, in tongues will uh, will cease. So that that's only a transitory thing, meaning it's only temporary. Um, even the supernatural knowledge granted as a spiritual gift is only temporary. That'll also cease. All these were only granted while the church was in an immature state, meaning there was a need for these things so people can understand um, uh, the faith in Jesus Christ, the faith of the church that he founded. And so there's a need for these gifts to help us understand. But we know that the fullness of wisdom and understanding of who God is and what our place is, is only found will be fully revealed at his second coming. But when once and that second coming is truly God coming in love, right? Now, but, you know, becoming in judgment, which is inter it's a strong dichotomy. He's coming to judge. The first time he came is love. He died on the cross. All are welcome to accept Jesus Christ and to receive uh, salvation in him, right? But when he comes to the second coming and is to judge the world, it's still in love. And lovingly, he said, it is freely given. So now it's a matter of now we have, we give an account at that judgment, right? And so, but so all these things will cease. The, the prophesying, the speaking in tongues, the supernatural knowledge, and all the other gifts will stop because now the time has ended to point out mankind will have to show. Look at, did they listen and heed to these, uh, the revelation that God had been giving, right? That has been empowering the church uh, and the people of the church to do, right? So that in our present state, so that's why it says this is transitory, meaning we are in an er er early state. So, so our present state, we are infants in knowledge compared to what shall be hereafter, meaning in the uh, after the second coming, right? So that when I uh, became a man, the speech, the thoughts, and feelings of the child uh, give way to those of a man, right? Meaning we know, like, we can think of our kids and how we see how much they change and develop, how they just learn to talk, and they are able to start talking a little more, and then as they start going to school and grow up, how much more they're able to comprehend and start talking as adult, young adults and then as adults, right? It's... It, it's it's a quick transition and it amazes us, right? Sometimes it catches us as parents off guard. Sometimes how quickly our kids grow. So it's in a similar way, you know, we don't talk. You know, we as adults don't remember how how we talk to children. Uh, we can talk to our kids now and see how they are talking now, but we don't think and have feelings and thoughts like they do, right? Uh, we can remember, kind of have um, uh, s a slight. Uh, remember that remembers is but you know fall back into bad habits or like immature habits but it's not but it's still with the understanding of from a from a, an adult perspective right and so that's why this when saint paul uses that, that imagery of you know we don't speak as a child anymore reminding that we have grown as we go in our faith right so but this will all happen at the second coming so that at when a death and the last day the imperfect way will give way to the perfect meaning our imperfect understanding and knowledge which is limited because we're still in this sinful world awaiting Christ's second coming will be will give way in the 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 resurrection right and so then all will be made uh, a new in Christ right and so that's what we're anticipating we and we we keep our hope in in that because of love that God has for us and that we have for him and for uh one another right and so then 
But then we start looking at some of the images that he uses uh, in the section. It's kind of interesting. He talks about the mirror um, in that uh, verse. In the, sorry, uh, what was that? In verse 12, for now we see in a mirror, uh, we see in a mirror dimly, right? Um, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, right? And so that imagery that St. Paul is using um, there is reminding us um, that the images were indistinct in comparison, right? So we only dimly reflect right now what God is going to give us by, you know, in the, in the, in the second coming, right? And so, but that's only found that because of our love, sometimes it'll be kind of disheartening. We can't really clearly see what that image is, but because we know of what Christ has shown for us, that what he has taught us and because his love for us and our love for him, uh, that doesn't uh, dissuade us from continuing on that road, uh, even though it's the image is indistinct in comparison to who Christ is, and it's dim, right? It's dimly, our knowledge of those things are imperfect and complete, but because of our, our love for him, we'll endure that, we'll, we'll uh, accept that because we know it'll change in, in, uh, when we come face to face, right? And that's at the second coming, when we come face to face without a veil or obscurity. So that's even like we think uh, when we write the icons of the saints, you know, the, the religious paintings we put in our churches, you know, they have that halo around them, that light of them reflecting the light of God uh, around their per their person reminds us that they're able to speak face to face without veil. And that also ties back to the Old Testament about this face to face and without veil. We know that when you look in the book of Exodus, when Moses spoke with uh, God face to face, like a friend, like it, it, that's what the it tells us in the scriptures that in those moments when he would go in the tent of meeting and he spoke to God and God would, you know, descend and that pillar of smoke, you know, and he spoke God face to face on that mercy seat. And it, it says that when he walked, came from there, his face was shining. And so that's why he would have to cover his face because the people cannot bear to look at the, 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 the reflection of the glory of God that was radiating from him. Now he is now able to be uh, reflecting of what God's grace. Now it wasn't of his of his own, he reflected that because of his uh, relationship with God, right? And so that his knowledge was even greater. So the more that we grow in our in, uh, in our walk with Christ and our walk with God and our faith as, as Christians, the mirror becomes more and more clearer, but it doesn't complete, become complete or perfect until the second coming, right? So then that's, but this face-to-face -face has a lot, it, it's, as St. Paul's writing it, it's tied to uh, how also Christ, now when he comes incarnate, is now is coming and revealing things of the uh, uh, of God and, and becoming more clear about God's uh, plan of salvation and then even at, as we as we'll read as we get to Holy Week and then we get to the Good Friday services we know that when Christ dies on the cross the veil of the temple tears in two and is opening up what was obscure what was never open but now is open because of uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ the salvation that Jesus Christ gives and that's and we know that that the, his death on the cross was because of his love for us, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that we that we should confess and believe in him, right? That those who believe shall not die, but have everlasting life. You know, we know that's that's there about our faith, right? And so, and so when we come to the point after the second coming, there will be um, no limitations. Right now, we have a limitations upon our knowledge because we're still within a fallen world, continuing in our walk with Christ. Uh, but when the veil is taken away, the full revelation. Uh, has come in the presence of Christ, right? And so I shall know even as also I am known in a clear manner as God knows me, meaning that the more that we continue in uh, uniting our, our, our ourselves in prayer and in fasting and in commuting in the church and in our uh, service to those in need and helping each other and strengthening our bonds as a church amongst one another and, and those who are uh, we are called to help and support, then it becomes, it slowly becomes clearer and clearer, right? So then that uh, leads us to the more the final part the, uh, of the permanence of this love that we see. That that's, the la that's the greatest of all things. That will continue to endure. Because like we said, the, sorry, the, um, uh, the gifts of prophecy and speaking in tongues and the supernatural knowledge and the, um, uh, all other gifts will cease, but the one that will always remain uh, will be love, right? So faith, hope, and hope. Love and love abide after all these gifts have ceased, right? And for these three are necessary and sufficient 
present salvation at all times. That's what is the greatest, right? Faith, hope, and love. And so whereas the external gifts are not needed after or are not needed uh, at all times for salvation, They're, they have their time and their place uh, for building up and teaching, but they will stop. When, uh, when they stop, uh, it, and it, it, it'll, it, it will, but the ones that will continue to be there is faith, hope, and love. But love is the one, is the bond between brethren uh, so that let's keep that keeps connected with one another. Faith is our is our, our is what keeps us towards God. And you know, hope is in uh, a half of ourselves, meaning we have a hope in our, that we know a belief in ourselves that we believe that God is there, right? So that hope is in us uh, because of we believe God is with us, right? And that, but even faith and hope will be done away with because uh, faith is being superseded by sight. You know, at that same time, we no longer be toward looking towards God and hoping towards God. Now in the second, but now we see with our own eyes of you know our own spiritual eyes and our the eyes of the resurrection by resurrected body, and we'll see by sight, and the hope will now be actualized, will be fulfilled, and then that but the love will continue to grow to be there. The love we have now will continue to be understood and experienced, and it will sustain us and continue to go with us in the in the uh, second coming in the in the uh, new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth, and all those. That uh, that'll happen in the second coming. So all this, like the the the, the fullness of our faith, uh, can be found by understanding, or not fully understood, because like I said, we're so limited. But but what we keep and 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 love reminds us that they will all be, uh, uh, will sustain us. So right? that'll be what will remind us of what we are doing and why we have these gifts and why we are doing these things and why do we come to church and. Why are we teaching our children and why we're called to support? It's all found because of love. All right. And so that here ends the, the, the study for um, on chapter 13. Does anyone have any questions or comments or clarifications needed? Okay, we got some time for questions or anything to clarify. And it could be also from previous uh, two chapters that we've talked about as well. Um, but does it make sense, you know, the, this 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 uh, st study on uh, uh, chapter thirteen about this idea of love or the of love itself? 